Todd Graves holds the unique distinction of being the only competitor in history to win medals at World Cup level in three separate IWSF disciplines. He's also an Olympic medalist from the Sydney Olympic Games. Todd is now a hugely sought after coach after retiring from the United States Army Marksmanship Unit at Fort Benning. Let's hear from one of our sports truly great all-round shotgunners. Very lucky to have from Texas tonight, we've got Todd Grace. Todd, thanks really for joining us again. It's been a long time since I've seen you, but I, uh, I always like to ask this question to start with. Do you have to be a champion shooter to be a champion coach? I think it helps. That's pretty much the response <clears throat> you get from everybody. So thanks for coming, Todd. How are you? You look really well. I appreciate it. Uh, it's good to talk to you guys. I haven't seen you. I haven't seen probably Lauren since, uh, what was it, London. Yeah. Probably London. I think yeah. London games. It's been a while since I've seen you. I said you wouldn't have seen me in a good state then. No, it was all good. I mean, it, it is what it is. I mean, it's like, I like, I, I, you know, when I, when I took the job, like we were talking about earlier, about when it took the team job, they wanted me to do it. So I took it. I missed all the shooters. I wanted to see all the shooters. You know, I enjoy coaching the shooters. You know, it, it, I love being around the game. That's why I'm still here today. If I didn't love it, I wouldn't be doing it. But it's always good to see, you know, it's like we lost two good shooters this year. I think it was – we lost uh, Kevin Gill, you know, yeah, really. this year, which is very sad. And we lost Peter Malik, you know, last year. Yeah. So, Sadly, so. that guy's aged out, aged Todd. So – I know. I know. Scary part about it. Yeah. That is How old are you now? How old are you now? I'm, I'm 57, so. I'm 56, so that's why you okay. just are a little bit grayer than myself, but not much. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing but gray. Listen, okay. if I took my hat off, I don't have a whole lot of hair either, brother. <laughs> I, uh, I, can, I have very fond memories of you throughout my shooting career, obviously starting my career in the U.S. and you being a big figurehead. Um, and you had a huge impact in terms of the way that you, even in my early days, influenced us in our shooting. Um, so I can understand um, that you are very passionate. You've always been very passionate about the sport. And I would like to just to tell you, you know, how much that meant to me as a junior coming through the ranks. Well, I appreciate that very much. It means a lot. I mean, anybody that ever comes up to me, you know, they say I'm probably the modest guy there is. I mean, I don't never talk about myself, which is good. I mean, I don't see no reason. You know, I'm coaching the kids because I want the kids to do well. You know, I'm not I'm not trying to get accolades anymore. You know, I've been there, done that. So it's all about the kids now. So well, thank I'm you. I'm going to talk about you for a little bit. Um, one distinction that you have that no other person in history has is that you are the only person at World Cup level to win a medal in all three IWSF disciplines of skeet trap and double trap. Todd, there's only been two people that I know that have made finals at World Cup events at trap, skeet and double trap, and you're lucky enough to say you've medaled at them. Do you know who the other person to final at three different World Cup events was? I would not have a clue. He didn't know that you were the other person either. It's funnily enough, it was Josh Lakatos. He when did Josh make a, a skeet? When did Josh make Korea, a skeet final? Korea 1997. He made a final at the World Cup in Korea. And uh, he remembered it. And then I asked him who was the other person to make a final. He didn't know about you. He was only worried about himself. But he finished, uh, well, fourth, finished fourth. But that's a pretty unique distinction. Uh, I, I just, of course. Of course. I want to ask you about your time. I, I think you medaled at the very first official World Cup in double trap in Los Angeles. back in, Yes, I did. I th yeah, in 93. sure did. Did you have much trouble swapping between the disciplines? Because in 1994, Todd, you actually competed at the World Championships in all three disciplines. Was that hard? Yeah, but it, yes, if I had to do all over again, I probably wouldn't do it again. You know, because it's like, if you go to the World Championship, even the Olympics when I made both teams in 92, it's like you're giving your 110% for that first set. That first, whatever you're shooting, you give it 110%. And then you're trying to compete for like 13 days or whatever like that. It's you can't do it. You do, you just can't do it. I mean, it, it wasn't beneficial for me, guys. Honest truth. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's an accolade or anything, but I just it wasn't beneficial. Um, what did you do in terms of your equipment? Did you have two completely se separate guns that you were using? For I had uh, two. Yes, I had two guns. I had uh, one gun for double strap and trap, and then I had another gun for ski. 
Did you set them up the same for trap and double trap, Todd? Yes, yes, I did. You know, because back in the day, we didn't know all this stuff today, you know, that or, you know, or five or six years ago, the way the double traps got with the high ribs and hold the high gun, yeah. you know, and everything. Everybody shot low gun, tracked the first target and went to the second one. You bring up a lot of things about the past. One thing about the past that sort of surprised me with the amount that the U.S. is dominating in international skeet at the moment. One astounding fact that I did not realize until I looked into this a little bit further is, is that you were the second skeet medalist ever from America um, mm. in international skeet, which is- I think Dreyck was first. Yeah, so Matt Dreyck first, yeah. then you. So yeah. technically you've paved the path for all of these uh, amazing athletes. Um, why do you think that is? You know, I really don't know. I mean, it, it, you, look at the, you, you look at the numbers. The numbers for us is like, you know, we struggled. We struggled in trap since shit. I guess you could say since uh, LOB since '96, when Josh and Lance, you know, did their thing in '96, and since then it's just. And we have the numbers over here too. I mean, you, you, we have our nationals. It's probably, uh, shoot, we'll have 140, 150 shooters, but our trap scores overseas just. I don't know. I don't know what to say. I, I don't know. But in the skeet guys are just, there's just steady Eddie. I mean, the skeet, they're just, I mean, I, I can't say that there's a difference between the mentalities of the thing or whatever. It's like, but I think the skeet shooters work a hell of a lot harder. I mean, and it shows maybe take it a little more serious. You know, I can't be for sure. Or, I, and I don't want to do the talent wise because I know we have the talent. We have, just as much talent and trap as we do in ski. You're um, obviously talking about the second international medal at Olympic level because you've certainly won a lot of medals at World Championship and World Cup level at ski. But, Todd, the American women's ski team must be the hardest team on earth to make. Why are the women so competitive? Well, I'm not saying the men aren't, obviously, with Vincent Hancock and, and co there, but the women are just ridiculously good. Why? I, you know, and, and it's it's just it, – it's talent pool. I God's honest truth, I would have to say talent pool. And when I was the coach, I could go to a World Cup – or before I was going to a World Cup, I could close my eyes, pick three darts, and just throw at six or seven pictures and take all three – any three, any time. Yeah. And they would do – just – they would do great for you. But I, I just don't know. I just think it's competitive side. You know how women are, Lauren. Come on. <laughs> They're more competitive than men at the time. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, that's true. I mean, that, I mean, it's true. And a lot of them, you know, uh, you know, uh, they just got talent. Shit, we're full of talent. It's crazy. But I wouldn't have said you weren't full of talent in men's track, but you went for two Olympic games and didn't have a competitor. I mean, you, you guys really screwed up the quotas in one event where you didn't really send your strongest team down to win quotas yeah. and you got beaten. And then you suffered for that. And then it was just plain bad luck, I think, on the second occasion because you did have a guy in Ryan Haddon win two World Cups in that Olympic period, but neither of we them. We did, but there was no quotas. No quotas. And there no quotas. You yeah. know, we actually put we actually put uh, we put a couple of kids in finals when it was quota time. You know, they just couldn't get the job done. I mean, but again, it's like the experience wise, it comes down to the experience too. You throw somebody in for a quota of the first World Cup they make, and then they go into the final, it just adds more pressure. You know, I mean, it just we did have a bad. You're you're right though. We did have a lot of bad luck, and I always had faith in our trap team, and which they finally did it at the Pan Am's. You know. They won both quarters, which is great, and which now you're going to have a damn Olympics. When did you get started? And also, how did you end up getting into the Army and then going on to be the U.S. Okay. coach? All right, so it was it was crazy because it was like one morning, I think I was like seven or eight, maybe nine. Uh, my dad and I were going to town, and we saw a bunch of people in the field, and we decided to stop just see what it was. And uh, it was a little trap shoot. You know, they had a three-quarter – inch piece of ply board with a pull string all the way to the machine out there with a the guy sitting behind a ply board. He called pull and he slings it, you know, and dad said, would you like to try it? I said, sure. So we went to town. I had a 410 topper single shot. <laughs> went and bought me a box of 410 shells, come back, shot the little competition and finished third. And dad asked me, he says, would you like to try this? I said, sure. So he went straight up and bought a machine. We went, had a bunch of land, clear some land, uh, and started setting it up from there. And then he got 
progressive we got in the one trap field we built two trap fields and then finally we went to automatic machines you know and then and then i just started getting better and better and started traveling a lot one of the best army trap shooters we had back in the day was alan hayes he now he was a kid that he was from mobile alabama okay. and when i was a kid shooting in laurel mississippi there i was shooting off of hancocks and all that stuff my dad took me down there and there was a kid down there named alan hayes and he put it on my ass and I, I mean, he was good and he was really good at that time. And that's, pre, that's what got me started really wanting to be good. And dad really started to build the machines up and build the ranges and all that stuff because of Alan Hayes. But uh, and he was the army shooter with me too at the same time, you know, but back to the thing. And then dad started building, we started traveling, started traveling, started traveling a little more and started shooting. And I got better and better. And there was a guy by the name of Ken Gilbert that was actually in the marksmanship unit at that time. And he was from Laurel, Mississippi. And he had put a good word in for me about there's this kid from Laurel talking to the coach, Burl Branham, at the Army. And so I graduated high school, and I went straight to the oil field, offshore making money. Army wanted me. Burl kept calling, wanted me. And I said, no, Dad, I'm not going in the Army. I'm making big bucks down here in the oil field. You know? And I actually woke up late one day. Uh, my alarm clock didn't go off. And I didn't, I didn't even call anybody. I didn't do anything. I packed all my shit, drove straight home and joined the army. What year was that, Todd? 1984. Yeah. 1983, I'm sorry, because I joined the army in January of 84. So you were at the peak of Danny Carlisle and Matt Drake. Yep. I had to deal with both of them. You couldn't have got two better skeet shooters to model yourself on. You know, but the thing about it was, it's like people always ask me, you know, back in the day, the way we stood, you know, nobody stands like we did back in the day. We squatted. Yeah. You know, matter of fact, there was a guy from Australia. I remember we used to shoot down in uh, Brisbane. They called him the snake. You remember the guy? The trouble with what happened in Australia, Todd, is that sadly for the Australian ski team, Matt turned up at our nationals one year and they all used to stand straight. And then Matt turned up and, of course, and Al Mullins and annihilated everybody. And then for the next five years, most of the Australian ski team were at the chiropractors every second weekend. <laughs> That's it. Hey, I did the same thing. We only knew one way because, hell, it was Matt Dry. He's world champion. He's Olympic gold medalist. That's, hell, we got to shoot like him, you yeah. know, until we all of a sudden, everybody's back started hurting and knees started hurting. And then we started straightening up a little bit. So uh, it probably leads me now and know where your roots in the army were, but you had such a beautiful, smooth technique at uh, Skeet. I loved watching you shoot it. And you were very smooth at trap also, but Skeet, Skeet was your game. But you didn't really enter the army as a Skeet shooter, though, did you? No, I was a trap shooter. I was recruited as a trap shooter. Yeah, so what? where did you cross the dark side? You know, at what point? You mean the bright side. <laughs> the bright side, yeah. <laughs> Uh, but no, uh, you know, I, you know, you remember Burl Brenham, you very well, very well, you know, and and so he would shoot skeet at lunch every day for exercise, and half the time I was a private, so I didn't bring, I brought my own lunch, you know, couldn't afford to go out to eat every day, you know, so he'd say, "Come on, Todd, let's go. I mean, let's shoot some skeet. You pull for me." So I had pulling for him. I was pulling for him every day, and then finally I was like, "Burl, I'm out here. Won't you let me shoot?" Won't you let me shoot? He's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and it just kept going on. I was like, bro, let me shoot. Come on. And he says, all right, I'll let you shoot. So I didn't shoot it too bad because I've been watching him shoot, you know, trying to pay attention to what was going on. And I shot it really well. And I said, bro, you should let me shoot a match. He's like, oh, no. You know, and I was like, come on, bro. He said, all the rest of the guys are getting missed off, blah, blah, blah. I said, bro, I can do this. So I shot a match. He finally let me shoot a match at Fort Benning. Because all the trap shooters, they were pissed off because they were having to work the match and I was getting to shoot the match. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, but I finished like second or third, you know, and beat all the skeet shooters there, except for Drake and probably Carl or whatever. I can't remember, but, uh, so he let me start shooting after that. You know, after that, I think the first time I went to nationals, I finished like second trap and second skeet or some, something like that. So, Todd, did you shoot a upright stance or did you originally squat like Matt and Carlo? I, orig I originally squatted. We all did. Well, I mean, that was just the, that was the only way we knew. That was it. So what made you stand up straight? I just thought it was effortless. It was more uh, – it's like when you squat, you have to work everything. You have to work your legs. You have to work your upper body. Everything has to work the same. It's like I started standing up straight because it makes it simple. 
you know, I could move from the hips and let the hands go and all that. And it, it worked so much better. And it was effortless to me. I started, you know, it was more effortless instead of having to really pay attention to your bottom side, you know. Can you sort of tell us how, when you went from an athlete to a coach, um, I know you've coached for many years in, in a wide variety of capacities. Um, do you try and teach the same fundamentals to everyone that you coach or do you shape it to each individual af athlete? I shape, I shape it. I'm a shaper. Yeah. I'm not, there's, there's no specific style to shoot ski. I'm sorry. There, I mean, I don't care who says it or whatever it is. There's no style. And most every coach has a style. I don't have a style. You know, I coach what, what that kid can do. That's what I coach. So what's the main thing that you look at when you're, you know, assessing that? Is it, you know, in terms of their eyes, like their, you know, in terms of establishing hold points and where they're looking, how they're standing, you know, how, how do you, how do you sort of work through all that? It's kind of hard to explain it because I can't sit here and tell you that there's a certain way to hold point, the blah, 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 blah. And it, you know, I just, it, it's just, I don't know. I don't know how I do it. God's honest truth. I can just see what the kid needs and I can adjust him to where he needs to be. Todd, do you put much emphasis on their point of aim of their shotgun or are you spending any time down at the pattern board with them? Are you, you think that the, as long as they can see down the rib, you can shape their technique from that point? Yes. I mean, the first thing we look at, sure, is see if the gun fit because I want to make sure the guns shoot where they're looking, of course. You know, and, but from there on, yes, it's just, it, 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 it's like most of the kids that I coach should already know how to point a gun. God's sure. honest truth. Cause you know, to that level, because it's like, if you train with me, you're going to get a workout. You can't, I can't have a, a, a 12 year old or a 11 year old that doesn't have the body strength to shoot uh, 30 boxes of shells in a day. Mm -hmm. You know? So for me, it's like, if I can tell what that kid's doing on station two or station three, I can adjust him to how his body functions to that target when it appears. Yeah, no, I think you've probably hit on it at the level of the shooter that you're currently coaching. They're pretty polished already. And you're probably mo mostly helping them a just fine tune their fundament. I mean, fine tune their technique and also their mental strength to be able to compete at the highest level with the confidence that's required. That's sort of what I'm hearing. Is that, would that be accurate? That That's accurate. I mean, the thing about it is, it's like, if I get a kid that's new, you know, I could, I would have to, you know, if you come take a lesson with me and you're a brand new shooter, if you don't take four or five more lessons with me, it's not going to do you any good. Yeah. You know, because every time I see you, I'm going to change you. Mm -hmm because you're learning separate things as it goes. One of the um, trends I've noticed in Skeet over the years is that years ago, everybody shot with a 28 inch barrel and then of course, 30 inch barrels. Yeah. Put in. um, and now I'm noticing more and more Skeet shooters don't actually use Skeet chokes. Are you still a fan of open Skeet chokes and 28 inch barrels? No. Tell us what your ideal setup is for international Skeet. My setup, well, hell, I shot 29 and a half. Yep. When I shot, I shot 29 and a half when my choke would make it 30 inches. Uh, you know, I had a kind of a, I started shooting a real tight choke because that 24 grams, they run a lot better with the shot string, a little tighter. When you say tight, how tight? Are you well, I'm not, modified, a quarter choke, improved cylinder choke? Well, it depends on where we go. So if I, if I have a student that goes to, say, Fort Benning, Georgia, and shoots a selection match, we're going to shoot IC light mod. Yep. If I go to Colorado, we're going to go to Skeet IC because of the you know the altitude and stuff. Is that because um, obviously the altitude at, at Colorado? But do you like the tighter chokes also because of the reverse pairs now on stations three and five? I mean, you can break them. You can break them with open chokes or whatever. But it's that shot string to me that makes it a lot better. You can hit miss. You got a little more. A little more leeway. Back to your life in the marksmanship unit. And I spent a week with you at some stage over there. It was virtually at the end of your career. And I can remember sitting in that unit um, in the headquarters there with you for a week. And 
I was watching you and I couldn't say that I've seen a more bored person in their life that was burned out of shooting than you were. You were counting the days down. I think the highlight of the day for you was feeding the rattlesnake each day that you kept in it. <laughs> but did you get burned out? Is that a fair assessment of how I saw you? That's, yeah, that's pretty much a fair assessment. I mean, you think about it. I mean, I was in the Army. I retired in 2009. So I was there for 25 years, you know, and, and it was like when I first got there and, you know, when, when you first get there, you got the Carlisle's, the Drax and everything. Sure. I'm going to be the first one on the range. I'm going to be the first one opening the bunkers and the ski fields, or whatever the hell we had to do being a private or whatever. But it got to the point, it, it, you know, and probably the reason why I quit and not saying that, that I wasn't getting older. My reflexes wasn't as good as my eyesight's not good anymore. It's just like, damn, it turned into a job. You know, you know, when I made the, uh, when I made my last run, my last run was for the 2018 and I thought I was training enough. My wife and the coaches up there, they said I wasn't, but I thought I was ready when I went to the trials. Obviously I wasn't, I finished like fourth or fifth, you know, and my wife still to this day tells me you didn't train, you didn't train hard enough. But again, I said, by God, if I didn't train hard enough, I don't want to have to do it again. You know, the best part of matches for me is when that summit was over. Yeah, that's a sign that you're burned out. Would you still recommend, though, Todd, that for a, a new up-and-coming shooter in the U.S. that isn't really clear on what they want in their life, apart from winning an Olympic medal, would you still recommend joining the unit? Yeah, I mean, I would because, I mean, if that's your goal in life, you know, if that's your goal in life is to win an Olympic medal, I mean, that's probably – what do we have in the United States? Maybe one, two, three, maybe four, maybe four shooters that can make a living shooting. You know, the rest of it, you're coming out of your own pocket to buy your shells and hopefully you get a sponsor of some sort. And being in the army, you're getting paid to do everything, you know, plus you're getting shells and, you know, and I mean, you know, and targets and stuff. Yeah. Hell yeah. I would recommend it. I mean, if that's, if, if your goal in life is to win an Olympic medal or win a world championship or anything, hell yes. Yes. Yes, unless you got a shitload of money and you want to do it on your own, you know, that's just the way it is. And you know that. Yeah, I mean, it, it leads to a lot of wonderful opportunities as far as being able to pursue the sport at the highest level while being, I guess, paid. And, and you, you would have had a lot of opportunity to travel and experience the world in a way you may not have been able to do if you hadn't have done that. No, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. I owe everything to the Army. I, I'll never say you will never hear a word out of my mouth about the Army. That, that they, I owe everything to them. You know, they, they, they allowed me to do what I'm doing. And I'm one of the fortunate ones that now have come off of it, you know, got to coach the U.S. team for six years. And here I am still doing it. You know, not very many people can say that. Your transition from the Army and then, as you said, as the coach of the U.S. shooting team, how did that come about? Well, <laughs> it's funny. I guess it was uh, I was I was when Brett took the team over and he asked me if I could help. And I started going to a few matches with him and helping them and stuff like that. And uh and, and then it just, so I would travel, be an assistant coach, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, a month before the games in London, I got a phone call that said he got fired. You know, we, we want you to take the team. And I was like, I am odd. Believe it or not, I am odd. I didn't jump on it. I was like, well, look, I have to talk to my wife and just see. You know, and I talked to her and she was like, yeah, you should do this. You should do that. Because I know all the shooters. Hell, I shot with them all. So I know how to coach them and everything. And, uh. So I dig it and then got done with the games. And I remember Russell, I think it was you that was telling me I was the most winningest coach at the Olympic Games. <laughs> we had first two events, we had two goals, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Tell me, Tom, though, it leads Like to I have a lot to do with that. It, it leads to a good question, though. What's a better system for the U.S. and not just the U.S., I guess for any country? Does a national team need a national coach or do you need a team manager that – then supports their individual coaches that know the athlete five times better than the national coach. That's, that's one of the hit and miss things that we've been over for a while, but it's, I don't know if you could ever do that. And the reason being is because you've got arrogance and you know that, Yeah. you know, so if you've got, if you've got somebody over there that's shooting this world cup or whatever, and, and uh, you're not his coach or whatever, and you're trying to help him. And then somebody's telling you, you need to stay away from my shooter, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's a no-win situation, so it doesn't matter. It, 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 if you tell them something, it's great. If you don't, it's great. 
because you know it's always going to bite you in the ass. Well, if he would have done this, you know, or he would have done that. It's a real loaded question, and unfortunately, uh, I expect no, that you look, well, you answer. Well, you look at the same thing. I mean, I remember, and this is, you know, I remember when Adam took the job. You know, when Adam took the Australian job. And I said, dude, be prepared. Of what you know, And he would ask me a lot of questions and stuff, and how long did he last? <laughs> another question, another question. Um, and I've asked this of quite a few people in the U.S. team. Um, if, if Todd Graves was funding the U.S. Olympic shooting team, it was coming out of your, um, your money. The selection system that you guys use is 500 targets and whoever hits the most, if you've got two spots, goes. The Italian team, they have a system where the Italian coach just picks the team and he, I'm sure, believes that that might be the better system. What's the best system if you want an Olympic medal, that the coach picks the team or you have a self-selecting system? All right, so this, okay. I wish I could choose my team every time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, it's an unusual response, but I, I, I take it you would say that because you believe you know who would, would perform on the day. If, if you were the coach of the current team that had that system, you may have picked Kim Rohde, and you may not have picked Derek Mine. Oh, and, and the thing about it is, it, it is great, it, but I mean, we could sit here and talk about this all night long. I mean, Derek did what he was supposed to do. I, you, I, I'm not going to take that away from him. I mean, he came in sporting class shooter. He came in and kicked shit out of our trap shooters. But, but so, you probably under the Italian system. No, have probably picked, not. No, no, I wouldn't have. No, I wouldn't have. And no. under the Italian system, you would have picked Kim Rowe, probably. Probably so. How can you go wrong? Yeah, I know. It's tough. I don't know what the right answer is either, but you were very clear in your response that you'd want to pick it if it was coming out of your back pocket. Of course I would. There's, I mean, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, who knows the shooters better than the coach? Yeah. But I, and I've seen them all respond to certain things and some of them not. I mean, now the second slot, I don't really know who the hell out of chose. Well, it's interesting because here that's sort of what they've gone down the path of doing. They have actually made it so that one person earns their spot, which is supposed to be creating a bit of depth. And then they leave the second position, or that's what they've done for this period, as a panel selection. So it is a bit of a 50-50. For, for so, who, so who would be on the panel? Who, who, who's that panel? Well, it's a three-person panel made up of the coach and what they call the high-performance manager, which is basically a paper shuffler, to be honest. It's something, someone that's not from the shooting sports. It's someone yeah, that's... that's trained at a university and then someone from our national association. And then it gets messy, of course, because they've all got different opinions. Well, it's the same thing with us too. It's like you, the United States will never be able to choose a team. That, that in, the coach will never be able to choose that team. You know how I many lawsuits would be flying around? The system that was used the last time around, though, where an athlete that got a certain amount of points overseas in the world's um, proven a track record in, in the world circuit, why was? do you know why that was dropped this time around? Don't get me to lying. I mean, I remember sitting down. We had a lot of things to do with it, but it was above my head, I believe, on that. I mean, the point system... I don't even want to, uh, I'm going to talk about it. Let's move on from that. I, I want to talk to you about in the US, the pathway to become an international skeet shooter before people get to the stage where they're thinking about joining the army. Is your pathway from American skeet or sporting clays, where do you get your shooters I, from? Most of them be just American skeet shooters and stuff, but just come straight out and just want to do it. Because again, everybody has that little dream. I don't know how long they take that dream, but everybody has a dream of trying to win a, make an Olympic team or win an Olympic medal. I think that it helps to have a strong base of competing in another discipline um, prior to just jumping straight into an international discipline and the, the hardest, you know, um, skill level. Well, I think it's, a, it's, it's important to, if you were in another discipline and you came into this discipline, like international skeeter, international trap, whatever it is, that you've learned how to win. You know, I think that's a big thing. I mean, there's a lot of people. Derek Mine, he knows how to win. You know, he already knew how to win, so the pressure wasn't as bad on him, I don't think. You know, and I think that's a big thing. If it's the confidence, if you've got the confidence and to trust yourself to go out there and shoot and break a target, 
that makes a big deal. That's a lot. That's a lot. So just in terms of the winning mindset, can you tell me how you break down a round of skeet mentally? To me, skeet's, skeet's simple compared to trap. I mean, you get to wander around the skeet field, you know, when you come off a station and skeet, and you don't get to in trap. Trap, that was always the thing about trap. And let, let me put this while we're talking about this right now. Trap is the hardest clay game there ever was. And oh, there God. Will be. Now, uh, now I'm gonna have to listen to this guy all night. No, no, that's no. I wanted to get, I wanted to get that out. That is the, that is the truth. That is the truth. It, and a lot of ski shooters are gonna say bullshit, but that's the truth. But again, trap. You have to stand out there for 30 minutes, whatever you have to do, whatever you gotta do. But ski, it was easy for me because I could shoot the station. I could focus for that five or six seconds and get off, and then think about whatever else I wanted to think about, you know, to keep me calm. You know, I don't want to think about what's going to happen in just a second. I want to stay calm for a little while and then ease into the next station, you know, and do my deal for that for five or six seconds and get out. And again, it's just eat, work myself, work, you know, work myself around the range, you know, so did it was have, so much easier for me. Did you have tools that you use to stay calm? I've heard of people counting and, you know, nah, singing songs nah. and all sorts of things. I, no, I had no songs. I had no repeating. I would look in the stands, look at somebody and make fun of them. And it, it's just, it just simple shit. And I was fighting demons just like anybody else too. But to me, the demon fighting is if you can, you know, you got something negative popping in your head, you can back it up with a positive just real quickly and just get it out of there. And by the time you get on the station, it's still positive. You know, you can think about all kinds of stupid shit when you're off the station, but when it comes to it, I was fighting demons just like anybody else. You know, and I, everybody fights them. I mean, even in Olympic final for me, when I won my medal, you know, I was, when I missed my first target, I thought I was still tied with somebody. And I remember, remember it was a low five. And I looked at the scoreboard and it said I was one up. And I was remember who it was. It was Henny Domplin. And uh, Nell, Nell, was, uh, Nell was his coach, you know, the girl from Holland. And, uh, and I was like, no, she'd be jumping up and down right now. The scoreboard was wrong. So I went to six and I broke six. Felt really good. Went to seven. The first thing that popped in my head was, oh, my God, I don't want to lose this on a baseline target. You know, <laughs> oh, what am I going to do? Miss low seven here and just screw it all up. And it's just, you know, shit like that's popping in my head. Then I'd fight it off a little bit, got done with that. You know, went back to didn't go to eight. Oh, my God, it would suck if I missed a low eight. Stupid. Just amazing how the brain works. Was there anything better in your career than going overseas and then not listening to the Italian national anthem? <laughs> Listen, and I'm going to be God's on the streets with you, and I'm glad you brought that up. That was my goal. That was my goal. As a U.S. team coach, that was my goal, was to go to a World Cup and never hear that freaking <laughs> anthem. <laughs> Uh, I would talk to the shooters about it. I would tell the shooters straight up. I says, we are not listening to the national anthem in Fiddly here. It's not happening. Todd, I want to ask you a hypothetical question. Um, and a lot of people will be interested in your answer because you are really the perfect person to um, give me an answer on something like this. If you were in the American U.S. ski team and you're the coach and you're also shooting in it, and you need two other people, but I'm going to give you three names. Who would you like to join you? You can have Matt Drake, Dan Carlisle, or Vincent Hancock. Who are you going to leave out to join you in the team? I'm going to leave Danny out. Wow, I thought you might say, I'm going to step aside and let those three shoot, but that's the <laughs> perfect answer. But You're it's just a, being a yeah. smart ass. It's a tough... No, that's fine. I mean, why not? I mean, shit, right now, I, I mean, I probably could hit shit right now, but back in the day, yes. It's a tough team. When you look at those names, really, it's a phenomenal era that you've grown up in. And you you were at Benning with all of those skeet shooters. Um, it, it must give you a lot of pride to be a part of that historical era of American shooting. And it was. I mean, the thing about it is, it's like, you know, back in the day and like the, the back in our day, you know, the, the 80s and the 90s and, and all that. Our goal, and this is no bullshit, our goal, we shot national championships for any match we had. Our goal was to put six black best in that final. You know, we didn't want anybody, no outgo, you know, with no, no somebody from outside to make a final. Was there that big a rivalry between the Army team and, like, the guys from Colorado? Yeah, like, like, yeah like, like, like Lack and Bade? Yes, there was. There was a big it – was, it was big. It was pretty big back then. It was healthy. I mean, it's not – It was a health. No, it was health, yes. 
yes, it was healthy. No, we didn't hate each other or anything like that. But when we stepped on the field, hell yeah, we wanted to beat their ass and they wanted to beat us. I mean, that was a big deal back then. One of the things that I can remember is just the amount of preparation and pressure that goes into preparing for a national event in the U.S. Because it is truly world standard to be able to even just make the team. How do you find, did you find yourself and also the athletes that you've coached, how do they then, you know, continue to put their foot on the accelerator to then go on and prepare for a world championship, for example? I mean, a lot of the kids that, that, that do make the team and stuff like that, it is hard for us because we do have the selection process that, that we're choosing teams and, and they put everything into that selection process. And then we have to, you know, let them cool down and then let them get, you know, try to get them back up to go to the world cups and stuff like that. But it, again, it goes back to the point it falls on their shoulders. I mean, are you happy? Are you happy if you just made the team? Are you just want a vacation? Or do you want to get your ass over there and let's try to win this thing? And that's just the, the, the different mentality of it. The hardest thing in the world for me was to make an Olympic team. It wasn't to go to the Olympics or shoot the Olympics. The hardest part was to make the team. You know, I had a couple of, I'm not going to mention any names or anything, but I had a couple of teammates. Once they made the Olympic team, they didn't give a shit. They were just happy they made the team. A very interesting point indeed, because Josh Lakatos brought up something that was very similar to what you just said. And again, not naming names, but Josh's big problem with the system in the U.S., in his words, were they gave away the USA badges too easily to put on the back of your shooting jacket a lot of people don't really earn them anymore. And he was very critical of it. And you're sort of coming at that same angle that, you know, it's not a matter of just making the team. You want to want to win overseas in that jacket, not just be part right. of the team. And that, but again, that's, again, that's what it was. I know what you said, Lauren, and everything like that, but it, it, it happens. I mean, people are just happy for making a team and getting travel. I mean, just because they make the team, I mean, they might not train as much to get ready to go for that World Cup that they did for the, you know, the selection match or whatever. And it's aggravating as hell because we can't keep up with that. We can't, we can't tell you if they shot or they didn't or whatever. I mean, we had no structure for that. Uh, one last question that we've asked quite a few other um, athletes that have got a history in the sport like yourself. You were lucky enough to get in the sport when there was no finals at all. And then you saw the introduction of a 25 target mm -hmm. final, then several variations to get where we currently are at the moment. What's your opinion on what is the best final system for an athlete and maybe the sport? Are they the same? I'm interested what you think. You know, we've been through it so much and I, I bitched and moaned, I bitched and moaned and I bitched and moaned about some of the stuff that we have to go through. I mean, you know, it's like the, 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 the double shit they got going on now, the doubles trap or in the, you know, the, the team events, I'm sorry, the team events, you know, they've been through so much crap on that. I mean, and we, we sit down, they want, ISS have always asked me a lot of questions about, Hey, can you come up with something like, like, like guilty and all them guys? I said, sure. We'll sit down and try to come up with something. And we did, Eller and I come up with something awesome, you know, but they turned it down because it, it you know, Pear didn't come with, with it or, or Italy didn't design it or, or, or something like that. Because, you know, the ISSF is, is kind of crazy because ISF is a bunch of chicken shits. <laughs> I mean, I mean, all, all they want to do is, is, is do everything for them. Half of them wasn't shooters. Half of them don't know what, what's right and what's wrong. And, and it pisses me off because they don't want to, they don't want to piss the European countries off you know, and stuff like that. But when we come up with a good idea or whatever, it's not good enough for them. Even though they sit there and say, hey, Todd, come up with this. Hey, can you do this? Can you do this? I had so many rule changes for them that was proper that they never even thought about, you know. But the, the final systems that we've been going through, there was nothing wrong with the old final systems that we shot the 25. You, you know, you shot your 25 after your freaking qualification. That's it. it That's all you need. You're saying that's the yeah, same. add the two together because yeah. I got so tired of, of somebody going out and shooting a 125, shooting a 125, and they can't carry that score into their final. You start from scratch. You got a guy that busts his ass for two days and breaks 125. You know, he breaks 125, he don't get to carry that 125 into nothing. He don't get shit out of that. You know, any athlete that agrees taking your qualification score away. 
But see, that's where I don't understand ISSF because why don't they understand how the shooters think? Not because they want to do it because of them. They're trying to do the TV thing. I understand that. You know, we're trying to get more television, but we're never going to be like golf. We're never going to be like, you know, anything like that. It's not going to happen. You know, you shoot the 25 after you carry a score in, well, oh, that's into that. You know, that's into that. And then when they come up with a 16, who shoots 16 targets? <laughs> what the hell? They ain't enough to do anything. And then you got Skeet Lad. Here's one of my big, this is one of my big bitches here. International Skeet is the only event that does not shoot the same qualification as the final. You mean the same type of targets, the reverse pairs being introduced. You're coaching them to get into the final, and then when they're good enough to make a final, you're then having to teach them some new tricks, which you're right, makes no sense. OTR day, you get to shoot reverse pairs. Then for two days, you don't shoot them, and then you got to shoot them again. Last question. Good old ISSF. Last question, then, and I probably know your answer, though. Um, what do you think the future of the Olympic disciplines are? I mean, here in Australia, it looks like we've lost our your equivalent to the Pan American Games is our Commonwealth Games. Shooting's been taken out of that pretty much altogether now. Really? Are you seeing strength in numbers of, of growth in the international disciplines in the United States, or are you worried that people aren't swapping over anymore because sporting is so much on the increase over there? I don't think it'll ever change over here. The only thing that's dropped for us is international ski. I'm talking trap numbers are huge. What do you do to combat to get more numbers in international speed in the States? So it, it, this is the way I look at it. Like I told you earlier, when I told you that trap is the hardest game there is, you know, but to me, trap is easier to learn than international skeet is. You understand what I'm saying? Because of the angles and the mount and all that stuff. You know, you could, anybody can go out and shoot maybe a 12, because they're going to hit a few straightaways, little quarters or something like that. And I just think it's it's an easier game to learn. I mean, I mean to to start with because they're breaking more targets instead of going to the international skeet side. You're not breaking any targets, and you can go to your American games again. And you can shoot your, you know, 23s to 25s. Who the hell wants to go over and first start international skeet? Shoot a two or a five, you know, because you get your ass whipped. You know what I'm saying? They don't ever want to do it again. And I think that's got a lot to do with it because you're breaking more targets at the beginning of your career shoot international trap than you are international ski. That's just my opinion. Todd, I know I've kept you a lot longer than what we thought. We oh, were. that's fine, dude. I'll talk. I mean, I ain't got nothing to do. I mean, I'm doing nothing now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, sitting around, I'm sitting around a bunch of animals here. This mountain did. I hope they're good company. <laughs> it's been. Yeah, they. It's, when they start talking to me, we got it going on. <laughs> it's been great to catch up with you again. A long time ago, I can remember taking my eldest brother, Jeff, down to your place yeah, in I really Alabama. Like I remember, I remember, yeah. How's Jeff doing? How's he doing? Yeah, no, he's good. I remember um, your two young boys, and they were only young boys, and they listened to my brother speak with his Australian accent and thought he was the crocodile hunter. And Jeff, They did. I remember that. They did. Fantastic to catch up with you and good luck in um, in everything that you're doing in your coaching career at VG Coaching and we'll uh, make sure that everyone knows that. I'm sure they couldn't get a better person to be under their guidance than you and uh, you've been a credit to the sport and it's great to see that you're still having involvement with all of the young people. Lauren tells me that years ago you were the one person that got in her ear and told her be careful of these Australian guys. They'll only leave you astray. If only she had have listened to you. <laughs> I'm telling you now, I still listen. <laughs> but it's been uh, once again. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Thanks, Todd.